It is lovely to see you all here. I'm Janet Carl. Barb Lees is away today. A few reminders. Uh, turn off your tea, um, turn on, that would be, <coughs> your tea coil if you have one. Silence your cell phones. And if you can help put away chairs at the end, there are dollies up front and in the rear for you to um, help with if you can. We will, as usual, take a short break. Today, maybe a little bit later, about, about a quarter of 10. Um, and yeah, that's right. I'm just checking to see if you were paying attention. Yeah, yeah. And besides, daylight savings time is going to be over pretty soon. Uh, President Harris has uh, kindly uh, agreed that she would accept questions during the presentation. And so if you have a question, please don't shout it out immediately in your enthusiasm. Uh, wait for either Heidi or Judy or myself on this side to come to you with a mic and then speak right into the mic. That will be great. Our speaker today, President Ann Harris, holds a bachelor degree in art history and classical languages from Agnes Scott College, where she earned Phi Beta Kappa honors. She received her master's and doctoral degrees in art history from the University of Chicago. She was appointed the 14th president of Grinnell College in July 2020, following a unanimous vote by the Board of Trustees. And just on a personal note, I will say we all remember with admiration how decisively President Harris acted during the first few weeks of the pandemic, acting quickly to ensure the health and the safety of students, faculty, and staff. Working with the trustees and stakeholders across campus, she recently led the college to enact a no-loan financial aid policy that meets full demonstrated need of students. Um, I wish I could tell you even more and make a longer introduction, but instead I'm going to say that uh, President Harris's topic today is the Middle Ages. Today, how medieval culture continues to move the modern imagination. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, well, thank you so, so much for this incredible gift. This is not just an opportunity. This is truly a gift. Uh, my delay, of course, is due to the fact that there is a lot going on on campus. There's a lot going on in our world. And trying to hold this community close and hold this community in safety um, is taking a lot of care. And I have, of course, so many, many good partners on campus. And it is so good to be in this community of Grinnell with you all. Um, even as, no matter as, but even as the world rages um, around us. So truly a gift to hold some time together, to think together about the layers of our history, to think together about layers of a particular moment in history, these Middle Ages, which arguably stretch from 350 to 1550, quite a long time. Um, as my students were quick to discover, that's longer than America's been around, yes. Yes, this is a, a deep, deep culture. Um, and my interest in our work together today is to really see in some ways what some of those resonances are. Not so much, oh, the roots of this idea come from the Middle Ages, but what are some of these moments that still continue? Um, and how do we even understand how we live in any particular historical moment? Um, it's never isolated. It's always in connection with other periods of history. So this is our chance. And I chose three different themes today. Um, I wanted to start a little bit. I don't think we, the lighting is necessarily going to work, but I wanted to start a little bit um, with just the, the way that I'm in insistently fascinated with how, um, <laughs> with how the Middle Ages pops up in American culture. It pops up in European culture a great deal. And of course, now there is a global Middle Ages emphasis. So what I'm showing you here, I'm not going to do the full video, um, although I could, but I'm not going to do the full video. But this is one of the classics. I recommend you look it up later. If you look up medieval IT help, you will see this video, Medieval IT Help. And y this is actually a Danish comedy show. Um, and so it's a little two or three minute skit. And what you have is this, a guy named Brother Ansgar who's transitioning from the codex to the book. So the, sorry, I should from the codex scroll, I should have said. So a scroll, right, you read by scrolling through piece by piece. And there is this revolution. 
in the Middle Ages. There is this revolution of, of books, and actually that is the word codex, so my apologies, that should be scroll, from the scroll to the book. Um, and there is this technological revolution of books and, and pages that turn one from the other. And I will tell you the hilarity of this skit, um, maybe I don't want to give it all away. I'm going to counsel that you, get, let you look it up, but what you're seeing here is in the subtitles. So to proceed, you just grab one sheet of paper and turn it over like this. And this is really bizarre to him. It's the way that, you know, I have to tell, like I work with my mom to say, no, it's okay to have multiple tabs open and things like that. It's the way that my kids say like, no, nothing stays on Snapchat. It disappears. I'm like, where does it go? You know, so all of these different technologies and this idea, and I remember when this came out, it, 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 I introduce, I use it as an introduction for us because in some ways, as the French say, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more it changes, the more it's the same. And I offer this time to you as sometimes we find understanding in the most unlikely places in history. And I think there is some understanding by dear brother Asgar of what it's like to switch from one technology to another. Um, for him, it was the scroll to the codex. It is hilarious, medieval IT help. I think it was from 2007, from a good long time ago. So I've got these three themes that I wanted to explore with you, how medieval culture continues to move the modern imagination. I wanted to focus on imagination, on debate, bait and on curiosity. And I chose three sets of issues to go with each. So with imagination, we're going to explore some love and adventure. Um, and there are some things that, you know, will be very familiar to you from our contemporary love uh, discourse. There are some things that I hope will surprise you. When it comes to debate, we're going to look at nature and agency. Who's in charge? Right? And we like to say we are. Um, the Middle Ages had a different uh, perception of that, partly because of their connection with nature um, and, and the agency of that. And then we'll end with curiosity. And this is one of my, oh, curiosity to me is the life energy of being human, uh, to be curious. Um, and here we're going to look at creation and creativity together. And throughout, we're going to be bouncing between the Middle Ages and the modern period. So let's begin with love and adventure. And my hope is to show you some objects that you've never seen before, or if you have seen them, to, to look at them in different ways. But I'm gonna start with what are called caskets. It's a, it really, it's a small box. I can show you quickly with a proportion of it. Here we go, well, we'll get there. All right, well, it's not ready for me yet. Um, so this, but this is a casket, it's a small box. It's about so big, smaller than a bread box. Um, there it is. And I'll go back to the beginning. Oh, I'll go back to the other image. Beep, there we go. It is um, f at the British Museum in London, and it is very early. It's in the 1180s. And this is a very important period because it's the development of what we call courtly culture. The development of a secular culture. The people who held culture, material culture, luxury, learning, literature, were almost exclusively religious from around the fall of the Roman Empire until the late 12th century. That's really remarkable when you think about it, and I do. I think about Irish monks on isolated cliffs, you know, dutifully copying out Bibles and sometimes classical texts and other, um, other documents that, you know, are still with us today. Many, many Latin sources are with us because of these monks who dutifully copied things. But material culture or what we would recognize as culture, uh, sites of learning, that was exclusively in the religious realm. In the 1180s, for reasons that have spilled much ink in scholarship, things start to change. There is an articulation of secular culture, and very specifically, it's still within a powerful class, it's the knightly class, um, it is courtly culture, courtship, what we would call today courtship, or being at a medieval court. Now, we have all sorts of ways of understanding our society today. In the Middle Ages, there were the three orders. Though I love this. Um, those who fight, those are knights. Those who pray, those are monks and bishops, and those who labor. That's everybody else. Um, so you can see the division of power. And in fact, the fourth estate, 
right, which emerges in the 18th century, that's really, that's journalism, the media, that's a whole other aspect. And just think about social media today and where we are. But in the mid Middle Ages, there are three estates, three orders, those who fight, those who pray, and those who labor. Here are, this is the visual culture of those who fight. And we've inherited a lot from knightly culture, knightly class, including how we understand how love works. So we've got a courtship here that begins, um, as so often with a love song, with music, right? This young troubadour, um, and it's called the troubadour casket, by the way. Uh, this young troubadour who plays this beautiful song for this young woman, um, very self-possessed as she stands here. And this is really, it's a fascinating work of art because it's made of metal, it's got cloisonne and enamel, all sorts of gilt and copper um, and bronze as well. And then he is successful, but look at how he's successful. He's successful in his courtship by being captured by her. So this is a really interesting thing, right? He starts to kneel. Um, she's got him by this very strange collar um, and is pulling him forward. And there's all sorts of, uh, this is all sorts, all sorts of things that you can start to, start to compare between the two sides. So you see, for example, here, oh, I have a pointer. Oh, I'm so happy. You see here, uh, you see here this flower has closed, is closed rather, and you see here that the flower is open. All these little signifying things, all these little, in fact, th uh, this, uh, my, my friends know, everyone knows I love where words come from. So the English word flirt is actually a compression of the medieval French fleur jeté, thrown flowers, like throwing flowers in someone's path, so to flirt. Now you know, when you're flirting, you're doing things medieval. Um, <laughs> it happens. So this is, this is basically this courtship, and you're seeing this really interesting power dynamic, right? The young man is wooing the young woman, but she captures him. Now part of this is because, and here is where the Middle Ages and the modern period are radically different, love was understood to happen outside of marriage. Marriage was about continuing the line. It was about, some, some will say very critically, it was really about property, right? But the average age of a bride was around 14 to 16. In fact, the, the more noble you were, the younger you were as a bride. Um, and the average age of the groom was in their early 30s when they had accumulated some land, accumulated some power. So the most familiar couple that you'll see out of this, if you think of um, Romeo and Juliet, they were, they were 14, right? They were really young. And that's where love happens, is in this young people's sphere. What's fascinating to me is that these caskets are wedding gifts. So what is happening that we're seeing these images of love um, which occurs outside of marriage on a casket which is supposed to celebrate a marriage itself. And that's one of the lasting mysteries, one can say one of the lasting mysteries of love and how it happens in, uh, in a marriage, how, how we've conflated love and marriage in our contemporary society. But it's so interesting to see the difference. And then I have to share with you our mystery man. Much ink spilled on him as well. So here he is in this very interesting kind of dance pose. His legs and torso are facing one way. His face is facing the other. He has a sword in one hand, and then he holds a key in the other, right above the actual keyhole of this casket. And I've often said to students, you know, the, the medieval caskets, these medieval boxes were the only private space that a woman had in the Middle Ages, everything, all the, uh, privacy is a whole, the, the history of privacy is really fascinating, actually. It's quite recent um, in human history. But here you've got, and I love that we see the wear of the key struggling to get into the lock. I think it's just absolutely magnificent. So that sets the stage for us to be thinking about um, love and adventure in these kind of different ways. So here, that was 1180. This continues and continues. The literature grows. The Romance of the Rose, Chaucer, all these, all this amplitude. And here you've got a late, late, this is from around the, uh, I think, early 1500s, a late manuscript. And you can easily see that, you know, the heart shape of the manuscript when closed. I think it's just marvelous. Um, shows things. And here you, now you see the notation of basically a medieval love song. So how does this manifest today? Um, we're going to be building up to that now. And I want to show you probably some of my, okay, I had to do this, right? 
<laughs> uh, but now, and this, even this is old technology, but certainly when I was in high school, that is how you manifested your love. You made a mixed tape uh, for someone and you put it all together, the same way that these manuscripts would do that. This next set of images, I, um, I hope you've never seen before, but if you have, let's delve into it together. These are also wedding gifts that show images of love. So again, this tension between love actually existing between two young people, marriage existing really more contractually between a young bride and an accomplished um, knight, um, and these gifts that keep asking us questions. So what we're looking at here on the left, you have a mirror back. These are all ivories. They're from the early 1320s and tw uh, 1330s when trade with North Africa was really picking up. So this is after, we're well within, um, we're after the Crusades, but we're well within the trade that lingered long after Western European Christians went to uh, the region that we call today the Middle East. So with this uptick of ivory trade, we start to see a whole other bunch of, of, um, of objects. Now, I do want to say there was walrus ivory, um, but it's, it's, it's not as pretty. It's very dark and it's very, the dentine is very veined and so forth. So this is ivory from elephants, part of the North African ivory trade. And we're not going to spend too much time on the mirror back. There are lots of these mirror backs. They're just beautiful. And here you see the young man kneeling, holding his heart in his hand. He has a lot of medieval imagination. And giving it to the young woman who crowns him. And here you have these horses being beaten back. The idea being that love civilizes you. Love civilizes you. Love enters you in this courtship, in this courtliness. Um, and there, this is where we start to see the profound influence of love poetry from the Islamic courts, which makes this argument. So Islamic courts in Spain by this time are very active. And of course, Islamic courts all over their Baghdad and, and, and in Damascus and so forth. Beautiful love poetry. My favorite is, is from an Andalusian, meaning Spanish, or in a Spanish court, um, a Muslim poet, an Arab poet in the Spanish court named Ibn Hajam, and he writes a poem called The Throat of the Dove. I just think that's a marvelous title, The Throat of the Dove. And it's very much about how love civilizes you, how love gets you to um, walk away from your baser emotions, your wilder emotions. So I don't know if that's true or not, but that was the argument in the Middle Ages. So here then we're seeing these strange little objects. We're seeing these little rectangles, not mirrors. I mean, they've got four scenes. One is here, this, I love this, this little tryst um, between a young man and a young woman, and her chaperone is none too pleased trying to get into the door. Here we see that same scene, the young man offering his heart to the lady and the horse kind of pawing at the ground. Can you believe this is carved in ivory? It's just beautiful. And then over here, the chess game. Chess was um, all, it had made its way from India by then, uh, very popular in Muslim courts because it was so deeply mathematical. And so we see a lot of chess that's used as political allegory, but here it's used as a love allegory. And there's a lot of really interesting scholarship about how relaxed the woman is and how tense the young man is and who's making a move and these kinds of things. So there's a lot going on there. And then here you've got the hunt, uh, the young man with his hawk and the young woman uh, they're both out there riding off, maybe into the forest, but this idea of the hunt, and sometimes you will see um, uh, a dog capturing a rabbit. So are these sexual innuendos? Are these simply kind of fun double entendres? We don't know, right? They're not documentary. They are, they are a part of this imagination. So what are these objects? Now we're just going to be a little bit closer. I want to look at some more of these details with you. Now you really see that chaperone. Hey, wait, stop what, I love how outsized the hand is. Stop what you're doing right there. You know, and then um, I wanted you to see the heart very, very well here. And uh, this power dynamic of this play. Again, look how relaxed her body is and how tight, how tightly wound his body is. And here they are. He's you know, making a move uh, out here on, on the hunt as well. And it's all these, I think what's interesting about these is that there's a power play and a power dynamic between them. And this is again, an articulation of this courtly culture. Um, when I used to teach this, I really would talk about it a lot in terms of gender dynamics and love as well. So let's figure out what these are. They are wax tablets, ho wax tablet holders. These were basically the means of letter writing 
in the secular world in the Middle Ages. As you know, right, a man, or as you may know, a manuscript is an incredibly costly proposition. A really thick manuscript is an entire flock of lambs, not just sheep, but lambs, right? Vellum, um, each page can sometimes be an entire lamb in some of our more luxury manuscripts. So when one is writing a letter, this is why it makes such a big deal about writing in the Middle Ages. Think of us today just flinging texts here and there, right? In the Middle Ages when they're writing, this is why they make a big deal, they either decorate that vellum or they'll put a big seal on it and so forth. But for these, and I, I think so much about all these lost conversations, for these secular conversations, for these quick exchanges, here's how it would work. You see here, this is the back of one of these um, wax tablet holders, there's a bit of a recess here. So you would pour your molten wax in here, scratch out your message, I don't know, meet me by the fountain, you know, um, I'll see you at the chess match, I don't know, uh, these little missives back and forth, and then you would close them, one on top of the other. You would either deliver them yourself, or more likely you would have um, an a, a, a chaperone or a servant um, uh, send them or uh, carry them over to the, to the person for whom they were destined. The person would read them, gently scrape out the wax, melt it, and pour it back in here again. So we have an entire body of literature that is lost to us. And I, I don't know, I don't mind living with absence, right? But I think I wanted you to know there's, there is secular literature that we have, and then there's this literature that, there is this literature that we know we don't have, whatever was scratched in here over and over and over again. So you'll see these sometimes because they're so easy to see, um, uh, the, the wonderful rectangular shape and so forth. I love this. This is, this is very rare. This is a leather carrying case for some of these wax tablets. Just incredible, just incredible. So you have to think early 14th century, um, and I don't know, sometimes I like to imagine that, you know, sometimes it was trivial things like, my brother's a real pain, or, you know, other times it was, let's run away together and so forth. But we will never know, but we know they existed. And of course, I have to do the modern one, right? The, the way it's so interesting to me how today, and, and actually students of mine pointed this out, these um, wax tablets are about the size of a smartphone. So there's something here that we've got, right? Something that's about handheld and, and immediate and so forth. We still want that immediacy between ourselves. And if my kids are telling me the truth, I don't know, about Snapchat, you know, some of these things are ephemeral. They disappear all over again. So what is our, the, the existential question for this, for me, is what is our relationship to ephemerality? What is our relationship to things that disappear, um, especially in the discourse of love, where we may not want it to be a record for all time, where we may just want it to be a record for this one particular moment? So with that, um, we'll transition into a, another very particular kind of image, which actually had a fascinating renaissance, if I can call it that, um, around the gay rights movement. So starting in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and when I think most recently in the, in the early aughts when there was the, um, oh, what was it? Don't ask, don't tell, um, in the military and so forth. Now, I'm gonna be very careful in how I speak about this image because there's a, to me, always a big surprise at the end. But this image, this one here, is in Cleveland. And they're about, um, there's a small, like 12 or 13 of these that remain to us. And it's um, Christ and John the Beloved, the two of them in this very particular moment uh, before, it's not a specific narrative moment, it is obviously before the crucifixion. Is it after the Last Supper? Is it this other moment between the two of them? And it's, a, it's to me, I, it, the longer I look at this image, the more I see it as this image of mercy and comfort um, and really quite beautiful. We have um, Christ here seated very regally, as he so often is. We have John, a younger man, unshaved, uh, without a beard, right, this curly hair and little blush of his cheeks. And it's just this marvelous um, gesture between the two of them of one hand holding the other and of Christ's um, arm or rather hand on John's shoulder. So, and, and all of it, right? This is stone, by the way, in terms of carving, right? This gentle sway. So I love the, again, dignified verticals of the drapery of Christ's um, robes and then these, this kind of sway that you're seeing in John here. So this was seen as an incredible image of 
um, a very different kind of love than had been shown by knights and ladies, by Lancelot and Guinevere. Like, what else is going on in the Middle Ages? And then you've got these texts, uh, very specifically that by Bernard of Clairvaux from the 12th century, who writes an interpretation of the Song of Songs. And he was a hardworking guy. He wrote a sermon for each line of the Song of Songs. And that is a long poem, so it, go, it goes on for quite a while. There's four books of sermons based on the Song of Songs. And in this, and the Song of Songs is this marvelous, it's a love poem from the Hebrew Bible, um, also known as the Old Testament. And it's a simple premise of the bride chasing the groom in the city streets at night. The bride chasing the groom in the city streets at night. It has some things that are very specifically historical, um, such as my favorite one is, your teeth are like sheep. Your teeth are like a flock of sheep. Not a one is missing. That's a bonus, you know, at the time. Um, but the, another one you may have heard is, your legs are like the cedars of Lebanon, right? The cedars of Lebanon is a beautiful phrase. Um, your breasts are like two gazelles loping down the mountain. This beautiful, you know, is it an erotic poem and so forth? It gets, it gets allegorized very quickly that the bride chasing the groom in the streets of the city in the night is the soul searching for God. And it's, a, oh, the yearning of that poem um, is just magnificent. And the, and the love that the bride has for the groom, he's always elusive, right? He's always elusive. And so in uh, Jewish tradition, uh, it is very much the soul yearning for God. Christian tradition takes exactly that same approach at first. And then there's a twist where it becomes uh, Mary yearning for Christ, wanting to be um, the source of the incarnation. Um, and I, I point to the pregnancy there, <laughs> um, wanting to be the source of the incarnation. But there's always a theme in the Middle Ages of the bride chasing the groom being the soul yearning for God. And in these poems, Bernard of Clairvaux has this incredible line to his monks. He says, be like the bride. Be like the bride. And, and people looked at that and said, whoa, you know, in our modern parlance, we would say, is that transgender? Is that arguing for a, a, a gay love? What is going on here? Then you've got Albert of Raveau, who is a Cistercian monk in England, and he writes these incredible poems. In fact, I've um, sent them to students. Um, oh, I should have had it up here. But I've sent them to students, and I've, I've spoken them at weddings. I spoke them at my brother's wedding. But it's about the love between John and Christ. Um, and what Albert of Riveau calls it is a spiritual marriage. And so here we're seeing this visual evidence of an articulation of love that I don't know exists in the same way in our modern culture anymore. But it is so captivating. It talks about someone um, that one loves being someone to laugh with and to weep with, someone to rejoice with and to mourn with. And there's this dynamic, uh, you can see why it gets taken up for, for weddings in our modern context, but there's this idea that these two together um, create this kind of space of kinship and, again, what Albert of Rouveau would call spiritual marriage that is so, so very powerful. So I just want to linger on this just a little bit because, again, I'm not going to stand here before you and say, aha, this is an icon of gay love. I don't think it's that um, simple, and, I, and there wasn't the same terminology at all. Was there what we would recognize as love between monks, as love between nuns? Did it become physical? These are questions that really depend on our readership. How we read, the same way we read Song of Songs, when we hear about these cedars of Lebanon, these strong legs, right? Or these gazelles going down the hill. Is that an allegory or is that a physical description? Um, and I think the medieval mindset, if I can use that, uh, really put it all together. So there's this incredible book called um, Christianity and the Tolerance of Homosexuality. It came out in 1980, right in the midst of the AIDS crisis. And it featured this image as, aha, we have this kind of gay icon image. And it had, all of a sudden, I think Cleveland was like, okay, let's bring it out of storage. You know, it's coming out and it's had a lot more display since then. I, I find standing in front of it really, um, I, I don't know, quite meaningful and um, peaceful. Here's the twist. These statues were made for nunneries. They were made for nunneries. So monks would have never seen them. Uh, and I think that goes a little bit against the argument that this would have been something that operated within a, a, what, what sometimes gets called a homosocial male world. These were made for nuns, mostly in Germany, mostly in this period, again in the 14th century. And here I think we, you know, we don't have as many texts about nuns as we do about 
um, monks. And it could be here that the same way Bernard of Clairvaux said, be like the bride, the nuns are being told, be like John. Be like the beloved. Lay your head here. And I always think of our nuns and our monks very far away from anywhere else, sometimes given over as a tithe um, when they were 12 years old. And this image of comfort I find deeply moving. I, I hope it, it can mean something to you in all different kinds of ways um, that we've explored. Okay, this is what happens. I run out of time. So I'm going to keep moving, okay? We're going to look at nature and agency here. Um, and I'm going to start by looking at this Ruthwell Cross, I don't have captions for uh, captions bother me because they get in the way of the image. We're going to look at this Ruthwell cross, which is which sets the stage for us to be thinking about nature. Um, and nature in the Middle Ages, it's really not until Thoreau that nature becomes a place of respite and kindness, right? Nature in the Middle Ages will ruin your crops. It'll <laughs> bring a fire. It'll do terrible things. And there's a very complicated relationship to the natural world. And the, the way I can synthesize it is the natural world is in charge. We're not in charge, right? And so here we've got this incredible cross. It's now inside a church in Scotland. Uh, hard to see, but what you've got here are a series of runes, R-U-N-E-S, runes. Um, this is old Scandinavian alphabet, basically. And here we are in the 8th century. I always love to think of the human effort. In the 8th century, and somebody has carved the, lyri the verses of what's known as the dream of the rood, the dream of the cross. Long before it was ever written down in a manuscript, it was carved in a stone. And here I do have some text for you. So this incredible poem is a dream poem. The dreamer says, oh my gosh, I had the wildest dream. Let me tell you all about it. Many medieval poems begin this way. And then the voice of the dream is given over to the main character of the dream, and that is the cross. And this I find deeply moving. The cross remembers itself as a tree. It was so long ago. I remember it still. This idea of the cross remembering itself as a tree, that I was felled from the forest edge, ripped up from my roots, strong enemies seized me there and moved me forward. To go from tree to wood to cross, these three different states of being, these three different states of materiality, that there's something to me, and this was a very popular poem, written down in around the year 1000, so already it had survived 200 years of oral culture of oral transmission. Imagine that, longer than our democracy. Uh, my students were always blown away, but 200 years of people telling stories and them not being lost, just amazing. And then finally it gets written down. There's, a, there's just a few manuscripts, but you see references to it everywhere. This idea that the cross was a tree at the forest's edge, that is something, and that the cross could remember itself as a tree at the forest's edge. And then it dramatically, right, it ends up being the cross that will bear the body of Christ. Then I saw the Lord of mankind hasten eagerly when he wanted to ascend unto me. Then I dared not bow down or break. And here you're seeing that personification of the natural world. You're seeing a tree that all of a sudden has this moment of pride, right? Like I'm not going to break up here. I'm going to hold um, this body. I trembled when he embraced me, but I dared not bow to the ground. And the complexity of this theology uh, <laughs> would take hours to un unpack because here we have the natural world speaking powerfully to a religious experience. A tree, a cross, remembering itself as a tree, becoming wood, being shaped into a cross, and having this emotional response, um, whether it's pride or trembling, uh, to holding the body of Christ. I was reared as a cross. I was taken up. I raised up the mighty king. And this is from old English literature. Um, and in all of this, Christ is seen as a kingly hero. Think of Beowulf and, and um, Beowulf as an example, um, King Alfred and so forth. He's not seen as a, a preacher or anything like that. He is seen as a mighty king. And um, they mocked us both together. A lot going on there theologically. I was all drenched with blood flowing from the man's side after he had sent from his spirit. So that's the dream of the root. That to me is important for us to think about together because there is debate about the agency of nature. 
There is debate about that. I'm going to skip this video in the interest of time and um, just let you know that there is this marvelous video. If you look up Melanie Hoff is her name, 15,000 volts, and I can send this via email too. Um, but what this artist does is take an electrical uh, current and sends it through wood. And as my students said, and the video simply shows the electric current going through the wood, the video, um, my students would always say, well, it's like the tree is doing a self-portrait because the way electricity works through wood, uh, and so it is this idea, again, the, the tree or the piece of wood is doing a self-portrait. It's this idea of agency um, of the wood. A really beautiful work, and she's actually doing great work in Chicago, um, very young artist at the time. Okay, before the break, I do want to tell you a little bit about bees, and then we'll take our break. So bees, this is another example of the, not just the agency of nature, but the theological agency of nature, and thus the debate around it. How does nature know more than humans about the divine? So this is a story of a woman whose bees aren't doing well. Her beehive is not producing honey. So she gets this idea. Whoops. Oh, I don't want to show you that yet. Come back. She gets this idea to steal a consecrated host, puts it in her mouth, and takes it back and puts it in one of the hives. The insects recognize their creator and built the most beautiful chapel with wonderful skill from their sweetest honeycomb for their most gracious guest and placed it in an altar of the same materials and laid it upon the most sacred body. So you've got this like, you know, host that's in her mouth. She puts it in the hive and this beautiful cathedral gets built around it. She can't believe it. She confesses all that she's done. And then the, this is from a miracle uh, dialogue. Um, the conclusion is, for although God is marvelous in his saints, he is shown yet more wonderful in these, the least of his creation. So these very um, pious bees. So when I was researching this, I'm fascinated by this agency of the natural world. I'm researching it. I had a colleague um, who was in the psychology department at my previous institution who kept bees. And I said, what do you make of this? This idea that the bees would build a cathedral um, around the, the host that had been put in there. And she said, oh, bees will build around anything you put in their hive. I thought that was interesting. And then I found out about this artist named Agonitha Dick. Agonitha Dick is a Canadian artist, and she does exactly that. She very carefully chooses objects that she puts into beehives, and then, as she says, she co-creates these works of art with the bees. And she's just incredible. She was so interesting. So this one, I believe, is called the, the Immodest, the Immodest Proposal. Classic um, Staffordshire porcelain. Uh, from the 18th century. Um, and it's a, again, we see the young man pursuing the young woman, but here she's demure, or is she trying to get away? And then you've got these bees that, in the end, putting this um, uh, what's her, honeycomb between them, to my mind, actually kind of aggravates the situation, makes them bound to each other in a really poignant way. Um, and she said that was, that was her point, was all these little, oh, young man chasing a young woman, does she really want that? And she said the bees gave expression to her distress, to the woman's distress. And I thought that was utterly fascinating. She and I had some correspondence over the years. She then, um, I followed up with her and she told me that all those years of working with bees, she ended up developing an allergy to bee stings, and she could no longer work with her favorite collaborators. I thought it was I thought it was really interesting because here's an artist that um, that ends up working you know really closely with with natural agents. So um, this is now. AI, alt, right, AI text here. So this fascinates me. The AI will often tell you what you're looking at in an image. And this was the AI's interpretation, a close-up of a sea creature. So it's like, what's the agency now, right? Is it the AI? And so that's where I want to end, um, really, with, the, with this break. Let's see. Yeah, I think I'm going to end right here for the break um, because, the, because we've got a whole other set of agencies to look at. But I just want to end with, you know, who's, who's in charge here? Maybe it's AI next. Okay. Thank you so much. We're going to take a 10-minute break. Please be prompt, and you, if you'll hear the little cowbell in <laughs> case you need a reminder. Great. I like this idea of a break. I think this is very wise and very, very good. So we were about halfway through, um, and having reveled in love and adventure and all the imagination thereof and seeing these kind of modern echoes, um, we're now in this period of analyzing debate, and that is nature and agency. As I like to say, kind of who's in charge? Who's got power, um, power to move things? And I think we do have 
I mean, I, I, it's one, one of the reasons I love living in Iowa. It's kept me humble to nature. Uh, you know, derecho anyone, um, or, you know, or the hailstorms and so forth. But you can imagine, right, in an agrarian culture, a hailstorm, um, of course, has many interpretations, but also a, a whole lot of devastation. So we saw in the dream of the rood the incredible power, agency, voice, emotion that nature embodied in a tree, which becomes the wood, which becomes the cross, could have. So I'm going to show you another example here and really start to think about um, the agency of natural materials. That's really the key here, the agency of natural materials. What can natural materials do? Wood, stone, etc. And then our own relationship to the agency of materials in the modern period. And I've got a good artist to help me out with that, just like I did with um, the bees and Agonitha Dick and, and talking about the agency of bees there to bees as artists. I love that. So what we are looking at here is a very unusual object. It is a portable altar. They were very popular in the 11th, 12th century. Right around the 13th century, the, by then, the, the church, which had become more and more the organizing institution of Western European medieval culture, um, said, you know what, we need to do all religious things right here. <laughs> so no more portable altars. So it has this kind of brief window. Portable altars are about the size of an iPad, um, and they feature, I'm showing you the simplest one here. They feature um, a metal frame that is not so thick, right? Truly about the thickness of an iPad. Um, and then very importantly, a porphyry stone center. So a kind of marble, a kind of porphyry, it had to have some kind of color that was distinctive and beautiful. Sometimes I refer to this as the abstract art of the Middle Ages because everything around it, this is hard to see, but you've got saints and all sorts of other figures all the way around. These were taken out to battlefields. These were taken to dying people's homes, usually a knight or a lady, um, but they were portable. And the power of this is that it was understood that this thin, little, small emblem had enough power to host a Eucharistic host because masses were performed on this piece of porphyry. Just incredible when you think about it. And you can kind of see why the church put a stop to it in the 13th century and said, if you're going to consecrate a host, it has to be done inside a church. Uh, no more wandering around uh, and, and so forth. So uh, you can see that because it, 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 it really um, distributes the power and it does so according to the power of natural materials. So here's evidence of this, right? This understanding that something like a stone can have power. So here, this is pulled from a 13th century pontifical. Um, this is about Christ, he who has spread the glory of the faith throughout the world and gathered the church. May he flood this stone with his brightness and may he bathe it in his eternal light. So this understanding that stone can receive and host, in every sense of the word, can receive and host the holiness of the body of Christ. That's a big theological argument um, for stone uh, to have that kind of power. So now I'm going to show you a slightly more elaborate one, and it really is going to get us to delve into this understanding of portable altars. This is the portable altar of Countess Gertrude, um, also from the 12th century. It is missing some gems as one would think could happen, right? Um, they're easy to, I guess, pluck off. Um, but, you know, actually she's missing a lot of gems. Um, but uh, this part remains intact. And you see here a whole series of saints all the way down, and then this incredible surface. So this is an altar, a portable altar as well, harder to carry. You would need attendance for this one. It was probably for her traveling services versus on a battlefield or anything like that. And we know that this was a consecrated altar. Imagine that, a portable consecrated altar. You could walk around able to host the body of Christ at any time. We know that it was consecrated because it contains relics. This is also in Cleveland, by the way. I'm obsessed with Cleveland. Great medieval collection and so forth. Only a nine and a half hour drive. Okay, so uh, we've got this incredible collection here of different kinds of relics. And for a altar to be consecrated in the Middle Ages, it needed to have relics. If you didn't have relics, 
the body of Christ, the Eucharistic host, was understood as a relic. So here we've got the altar, the portable altar upside down, but you get a sense of scale. This is a, a little tiny piece of paper. This is a piece of cloth. These are various um, bones and claws and so forth. And relics are definitely one of those moments when we say, okay, the Middle Ages is not us, right? Walking around with bits of teeth and, and hair. And my favorite relic are the tears of Christ. Those are beautiful. Guess what? They're empty. You can't see anything, but they're beautiful crystal vials. Um, there are some of the breast milk of Mary and others. And I remember, you know, early in my teaching, the students were like, this is dumb, is what they would say. This is weird and this is dumb. And it got me thinking a lot about value and what we ascribe value to. So what I would say to them is, okay, I take your point. Um, does anybody have, and I, I would say, a $10 bill? This, by the way, is impossible to do today. Nobody carries cash. But I would say, does anybody have a $10 bill? They'd say, yes. I would hold it up, and I'd say, do you mind if I just tear this up? No, that's 10 bucks. I said, well, it's really paper and ink, and we've all agreed that it's $10. We've agreed that that has the value. And then I would always give it back. I never tore it up. Um, I totally get it. But I think we're seeing that same value system here. These are objects that are deemed valuable. They're deemed powerful. We have many unexplored values in our culture today um, that are, you know, gold is kind of self as self-evident um, as valuable, but there's lots of things like cash uh, that have value that in, in material form do not actually have value. Yeah, gold and honey, I did want to say about honey, I, um, bees are really interesting. Um, honey can't rot. Honey cannot spoil. There's too much sugar in it. And that's one of the reasons that you can try, I mean, it can crystallize. I've had that happen on my kitchen counter, uh, but it will never rot. It'll never grow mold or anything like that. And that was one of the reasons, by the way, that bees were also associated with the divine. So here we are looking at the underbelly, if you will, of this portable altar. And I've spent some time here because I really want us to get a sense of the dynamic of all the material agency whether it's cloth or bone or stone, these things have power. At the very least, the power to host a Eucharistic host. They also might have a miraculous power, which relics were often associated with. So you might be wondering why I would show you a toaster at this point. Okay, I'm showing you a toaster because here we have a modern lesson taken on by this incredible artist that I really admire because he stops and he thinks about things and he kind of turns them over and he doesn't take anything for granted. So the toaster, he argues, is the most mundane object. He's British, he's like, uh, it's the most mundane object one could buy at the Mark and Spencer and it's gonna help me think about material agency, about where um, materials come from for even the most mundane thing, with $12 at the Walmart, $6 at the Walmart, right? Totally ordinary toaster. And he says, the way I'm gonna understand the material agency, the way I'm gonna understand material power here, I'm gonna make one from scratch. So he decides to make a toaster from scratch. It's like, it's a totally ordinary household item, no problem. Well, first thing he does is take the toaster apart. Oh, this is his name, by the way, Thomas Thwaite. He does a lot of things. He also scampered around a mountain in, in a goat uh, uniform and all these guys. So he's a very, very interesting guy. <laughs> I will tell you that. He's really, really, here's the, the toaster project is what we're gonna talk about today. So the first thing he does is take apart the toaster. It's a little more complicated, <laughs> a little more complicated than he thought. And he's like, okay. Again, the simplest object. What I just showed you was a complex medieval object. I'm now showing you what is seen as a simple modern object. But this artist, Tom Thwaite, really argues that even the simplest objects in our modern culture are incredibly complex. Undeterred, however, he starts to pursue all these different elements. And there are many. There is iron ore, there is steel, there is plastic, mica, copper, nickel, oh, and plastic again. I, um, th there's different kinds of plastic that he's using. He chronicles all of this. He travels to copper mines. He does all sorts of things to demonstrate how difficult um, it really is to make such an object. And of course, what he's pointing out are global economic networks of material culture, right? Global economic networks. And I will tell you, I have never toasted toast the same way since since I got to know his work. So he travels all over, the, he gets a grant to do this, he travels all over the world, um, he's smelting his iron ore, he does all sorts of things. 
Leaf, exactly. And he's doing it really all on his own, right? So he makes plastic out of, it's potato plastic. And actually, you sometimes you see potato plastic. Um, we use it sometimes at Grinnell College. Uh, it's seen as ecologically sound and so forth. He's very proud of his entirely homemade toaster. And here it is. <laughs> <laughs> So, but it's all homemade, right? The plastic is really hard to mold, but he says he's proud of it because it works. I don't know if I'd put my precious piece of bread in here, but he can plug it in. It connects to the electrical circuit. He can, he's got his lever here and so forth. And I, I think it's a fascinating project, aside from the like weird, you know, monster quality, perfect for after Halloween, um, of his toaster. And he, he goes about this, I think there's way more views now, but he gives a TED talk about it. Um, I think it's one of those things, and I hope that this talk, that, that our time together, you know, um, creates more conversation among you and so forth. But I think it's worth looking up the toaster project. You'll see uh, many more of his explorations there. So again, bringing it all back to this idea of the agency of things, the agency of, of n what we call natural, things that are found on this planet. This is the comparison I want to make between this complex medieval object, this supposedly simple modern object, and what happens when we stop, when we pause, and we just lay things out, and we think about all the materials that come together whether it's for our spiritual lives, whether it's for our daily breakfast, but how these things, how these material agents, how this nature, this natural stuff comes together to create these spaces for us, and I would say toast is comfort for me, certainly. Um, uh, this would be a kind of spiritual comfort that gets uh, taken up there. So it's an invitation to think about our objects, and of course, I can't begin, and, and this is what I love, I can't begin begin to understand the complexity of this object, and yet I hold it in my hand. Myrna Hernandez will tell you, too many hours in the day, right? Put the phone away, put the phone away. But these objects are with us, and, and so that's a good point, actually. The agency of the phone in my life is pretty intense, right? This material object that has no thoughts or feelings nonetheless shapes my days every single day. It's because of the communication that it holds, and of course, the communication that the altar holds is with the divine. Um, the communication the toaster holds is with a yummy breakfast. Okay, all right, so then we'll end. We'll end our time with curiosity um, and this profound fascination we can have with creation and creativity. Creation and creativity, how things get created and where our sense of creativity comes from. So there's a whole lot of um, world enough in time. We talk about Genesis and all these kinds of things. But what we're going to do instead is dive right into this fascination. Again, we're, uh, a carryover, this fascination with material objects and how they themselves are creative. So I've got two texts here that are really interesting. One is extremely complex. It's the letter of Prester John. Prester John's letter starts to appear in the 12th century around Western Europe, and it gets, especially has a lot of traffic in uh, Germany and France. And it's written by this priest, Prester, written by this priest John, who writes to Western Europe from his place in Ethiopia where he has an enormous Christian kingdom and he is just waiting for Western European Christians to come over and join him. They just have to get through the Muslim kingdoms in between. This is definitely a product of the Crusader period. And in fact, uh, you may know, right, many of, for example, Christopher Columbus's idea to go the other way was because trade was getting difficult with Islamic and Arab empires and going around, um, uh, going around Africa wasn't going so well either. So he went the other way and there's a lot of history after that. But the letter of Prester John is fascinating. It is completely made up. It is this fascination of Western European culture with a land where there are material, um, not just riches, but material agency. So Prester John describes his lands. First of all, he says, I'm pretty close to paradise. Um, paradise was seen as, hap as, as being in today's Middle East region in, in near Jerusalem. Um, extends its windings by various courses throughout the entire province and it or found natural gems, emeralds, sapphires, carbuncles, topazes, etc., etc., etc. And just this listing, there's a lot of listing in this period. The idea being that even this creation 
even these stones are themselves creative agents. They create power, they create glory, and so forth. Then you've got Abbot Suger. Um, he's more in the, let's see, late, early, yeah, late, late 12th century. And he writes this incredible book. He's our one abbot who writes about what it was like to build a cathedral. So everybody reads his book. And I love the title, On the Administration. Yay! administration so uh <laughs> so he too starts to do this work of gold a rich abundance of precious gems look at this listing hyacinths rubies sapphires emeralds and topazes and a variety of pearls more than we ever hoped to find gold gems and precious pearls and this may sound counter to christian humility or to christian denial of the material world it's not. There's these, these lists, and this is an article I never got to write, but this practice of lists are to elicit wonders. You could never imagine so many sapphires, emeralds, etc., etc. And there's lots of manuscript tradition of Prester John. And there were, there were literally expeditions for Prester John. He ends up moving around. He ends up in India as well, um, especially as the Portuguese are doing more exploration in India and Goa to this day. We'll, we'll go back to Goa in a minute. Um, is is uh, a site of Portuguese exploration in the 16th century, much, much later. So Prester John is here sending his famous letters. Right? You see the seal here. Of course, he's got parchment to spare. He's got vellum to spare. He's incredibly wealthy. Um, there's no such thing as Prester John, but it was so powerful in the imagination, this idea of what is this curiosity? And it drove people. Here, I'm not going to read all of this, but this is another excerpt from this. It was a long letter uh, from Prester John. So he's talking about the roof of his house being made of ebony so that under any circumstances it's not able to be burned. No one is, it, the larger gates of the palace are of sardonyx inlaid with serpent's horn so that no one is able to enter secretly with poison. I guess that comes in handy uh, when you're a ruler. Um, the pavement is of onyx and the walls inlaid with onyx so that by the power of the stone, the courage of the warriors grows. How about that? And then my favorite, our bed is of sapphire. I can't imagine that's comfortable. However, our bed is of sapphire on account of the stone's virtue in chastity. So here, <laughs> a lot to unpack there. Uh, so here you're seeing, right, th his warriors war walk on stones that increase their courage. His gates are such that no one's able to enter um, secretly with poison. These are clearly the fantasies of Western Europeans who probably don't have gates that prevent poisoning, um, who don't have stone that increases the courage of the warriors, but they create this whole imaginary world, right? This curiosity, they're eliciting curiosity. They're creating this imaginary world of it could be like this. And he's a very, very important figure in the 12th, 13th century. And the quest for Prester John, there's some really great books about this. The quest for Prester John continues for 400 years. He shows up on maps. He shows up in all these, this idea again of a Christian kingdom on the other side of Muslim Arabic kingdoms. So uh, here's just a couple more illustrations. Uh, here they are doing a ruby harvest, because you know, rubies pop out of the ground like your basic potato. Actually, potato is a so-called new world uh, crop, but you know, your basic cabbage. Um, and here it's, it's also, there's pepper, um, rubies, all sorts of things. But again, it's the point about curiosity. So here, I want to take that back and really be in this, I think, kind of uncomfortable space. It was always uncomfortable for my students. Uh, I thought Christianity was humble. Yes, and, right? In this period, so this is the Lothar cross from the year 1000. Um, and we have to think, how is power manifested? It can be manifested by land. It can be manifested by, um, oh, charisma sometimes. It can be manifested by loyalty. There is this element, and especially in the conjunction of those who fight and those who pray. So knights giving gifts to churches. Um, and you've got that here with Lothar, who was a king in the um, Germanic regions of Europe, giving this unbelievable cross. It's still in Germany today. And this is actually just the, whoop, whoop, whoop. This is just the top of the cross. Here we go. No, let's, let's, let's hang out here. This is just the top of the cross here, right? The actual, uh, the, the staff, sorry, would have been down below. So this would have been up high. And slides can't come 
close. You have to imagine this moving through a church space. You have to imagine that church space being lit with candles. You have to imagine all these gems and jewels glinting off the candles and so forth. But there's something really unusual about this, and it's one of those like, huh, so what are the rules about depicting the divine? Here in the center of the cross, where you would expect to see, if not Christ, then something abstract or something um, beautiful, you wouldn't expect to see a Roman emperor. And this is Emperor Augustus with his eagle of Jupiter, 100% not a Christian guy, right? So here he is in the midst of this, but the curiosity of the cameo, the creation and the creativity of the cameo is so powerful, it overrides the need to depict Christ in any kind of realist, uh, I'm not going to say realistic, in any kind of, quote, um, typical way of depicting Christ as a humble man with just a loincloth um, and a beard and so forth, which was very already common by this period. But this piece, that I, this next slide is probably my favorite, favorite, favorite to show. Um, this incredible cross, this incredible detail. This is a friend of mine who got that close. She was able to take a photograph of it. What I want you to appreciate about this is how everything, of course, is handmade. These are, you know, tapping the gold around the gem. And then this is called filigree. This is squeezing out, um, it's, it takes like a, almost like a little um, pliers um, and turning the gold so that it creates these beautiful little balls all around hundreds and thousands of hours of work. And so again, this idea of creativity and curiosity, but each one of these, and this one you will notice is better than Countess Gertrude's altar, uh, is pretty intact, right? They're really still mostly there. That's because it, it's never left the church um, atmosphere at all. So what, how do you depict the divine? In the year 1000, they said, with a Roman pagan emperor. And then they did it again. This one's incredible. This is the Harriman Cross. It's in um, Cologne, Germany. It's also from the 12th, uh, sorry, 11th century. It's a brother and sister team. So it's actually Harriman and Ilsa. And they give this gift. And it's now here you do see Christ, right? Now let's see if I have my detail for you. You do see Christ on a cross. But you may notice that there's something unusual going on in his head. For example, that it's bright blue. That is because... His head is made entirely of lapis lazuli. Exactly. Which you can only get in modern day Afghanistan. And still to this day, that's where the mines of, or that's where the deposits, I should say, of lapis lazuli are. A chunk of lapis lazuli that big is enormously precious. Never mind that it's the head of an empress named Livia. Right? So this is another moment where, again, you would think, well, if you're depicting Christ, you would at least have a masculine face. Um, you would at least have, you know, if now we're used to the idea of a Roman emperor, but it's, it's this woman, it's, a, it's an empress named uh, Livia, uh, recognizable from other portraits of hers. And there's other angles of this where you can see these details, um, but carved and probably part originally of a cameo, but extracted from that and then inserted into this incredible, incredible um, crucifix. Uh, that one, uh, and it's just, so this one is a cross proper. It's not big at all. It's about this big. Yeah, so wide. And it's in this really unusual uh, museum in Cologne, which is the Diocesan Museum, where they love to do interactions of medieval and modern art. So they spoke to my heart very, very much. Um, I had promised you we'd go back to India. Uh, and this is, again, just to show you what, what can curiosity do? What can curiosity create? Um, so this is a chalice. You may recognize the form of a chalice, um, beautiful metal, and so on and so forth. And um, this chalice is uh, made of a coconut. <laughs> it is made of a coconut shell. And it actually depicts Charles II, so I'm cheating a little bit. We're in the 1650s here. But there are medieval treatises on the coconut. So there, we have our Portuguese explorers. Of course, they bring a lot of Catholic curiosity, um, a lot of Catholic scholars. And in the coconut, they see a trinity. They see the rough exterior. They see the white meat of the coconut and they see the refreshing milk of the coconut. So the milk of the coconut is understood as the, um, uh, uh, the, as the Holy Spirit. The flesh of the coconut is understood as Christ and the body of the coconut encompassing it all is understood as God. No 
piece of the natural world was left unexplored without all of these marvelous, marvelous things working into it. Okay, so we'll finish out our time uh, with this kind of little meditation on curiosity. Perfect, because I can't wait for your questions and any kind of discussion that we can have. Um, these, the, we have very few images that talk about what it means to make art. What's that? Yeah, what it means to make art. And this is from a, I keep doing that. Oh, my heavens. There we go. This is from a stained glass window in Chartres Cathedral, uh, the big one, <laughs> the one that didn't lose a whole lot of glass during the French Revolution like Notre Dame in Paris did. Um, and there are dozens and dozens of windows always getting cleaned. And this one is the Saint Charon window. It is uh, the windows of the sculptors. The Sculptors Guild gave this window. So you see them with a plumb line uh, trying to get it right as they build towers. These are the sculptors and masons. You see them here carving things out. And then this is where I want to spend a little bit of time if I have my close up. Yeah, but I want to spend more time here. Okay, this is this interaction that I think is just fantastic. So we're in stained glass. We have our sculptor and we have our architect. And we have our sculptors over here as well. But I want to focus on these two because some of this is the wear of the glass, but it's also probable that this man's skin was already seen as kind of darker because he was a laborer. He was out in the sun more. Here we've got our architect, and he's engaged in a classic pose of contemplation. This. I mean, we still kind of do that. You know, tell me more. Um, and his contemplation is directed at this sculpture down here. And I love this. The sculpture looks right back at him. <laughs> right back at him. And I can give you the detail. Here we go. The sculpture looks right back at him. And of course, in the realm of stained glass, they are one and the same, right? There, this is, these are both made of stained glass. The eyes are carved in the same, or painted, I should say, in the same way, and so on and so forth. But this idea of the artist looking at his creation and the creation looking right back at him is really, really important in the Middle Ages. And then here, one of the classic, this ties it all together. One of the classic myths of the Middle Ages is actually Narcissus. Now, in the modern period, Narcissus is actually, let's see, the name we've given to a pathology, right? Narcissism. But in the Middle Ages, he was actually a hero of love. So thank you, Freud, you ruined Narcissus. So, uh, but before Freud, right, Narcissus was seen as a hero of unrequited love. So you may know the myth. Um, for this is from, from pagan antiquity. Narcissus uh, gambling about and so forth and, and finds himself at a stream, looks down in the water, a very calm stream, looks down in the water and sees his reflection and just says, oh, you are good gorgeous. You are beautiful. And then, of course, he reaches in and the image disappears. Now, Narcissus is smitten and bereft. There's a reason that he is. It's because the woman who loved him, Echo, asked for him to be cursed. Echo and Narcissus are together. Narcissus says, I got better things to do. I don't want to be with you. And Echo cries out and cries out and echoes and echoes where we get the word echo and echoes and echoes until she just becomes sound on the wind. And she's avenged by Narcissus. She says, as I died from unrequited love, I want him to die from unrequited love. And he does, <laughs> right? He ends up falling in love with this image um, of himself. He doesn't understand that it's himself. And so every time he reaches in for it, it disappears. And finally, he does too pine away. And this is why the flower of Narcissus grows by water. Th so, so goes the myth, right? But in the Middle Ages, Narcissus, as I said, is a hero of unrequited love. He is also, also sometimes discussed as the first artist. And I think this is very powerful, that the first artist is the one who simply recognizes that something is a work of art. You don't even have to make it. Think about that for creation and creativity. You don't even have to make it. You just see it, think it, perceive it, understand it as art. And I invite us to think about that. This is part of the reason I love that comparison between the toaster and the, um, the altar is one would never say that a toaster is a work of art. But if you look at it a certain way, 
it's got elements of being a work of art. It's got all these things, all these powerful materials that work within it. So I wanted to end with these images here of Narcissus as not narcissism, not even as a hero of unrequited love, although we've spent some time talking about love, but really as the first artist and the idea of art being that it's what you recognize as such. Now, I don't think that I necessarily have time here to go into this. So I, I plant the seed again um, in talking to you very briefly about AI, artificial intelligence, and how now increasingly it is creating art. So there's this specific one called DALI, um, and you can go to that one. It's a, it's a really interesting one. So there's ChatGPT that creates text, and there's Dali that creates images. And we had fun with students. All we said to them, you know, you can, you can say to Dali, um, show me an image of dogs playing poker um, if Warhol painted them. Show me an image of, uh, well, myself if Picasso painted me. And it'll do it. Right? It has all, it has everything it needs to do exactly that. So there was this really fascinating article that I just want to quote from in ending here. Um, it was fascinating. We asked Chad GPT about art theory. It led us down a rabbit hole so perplexing, we had to ask Hal Foster for a reality check. And this is the wonderful way. It's called the uncanny valley in people who study this stuff. It's the way that artificial intelligence gets us wrong. I think that's really, that's a, soon enough, it won't get us wrong. It'll do exactly what we ask. But right now, we're still in this period where, for example, they asked it about art theory. It, ChatGPT gave them a whole bunch of false references about Hal Foster, who is still very much alive. They ended up asking Hal Foster, and he was like, I never wrote that, but it looked very believable. Here's my favorite line from the article. They talked about all these things about medieval art as well. And this is ChatGPT talking now. So ChatGPT says, however, it should be noted that AI is not influencing the creation of new works of medieval art. <laughs> there can't be new works of medieval art. It's over, right? But just I'd love to end here with you because I, I think, you know, and part of me, part of me sees the absurdity of this. Like, no, we can't be creating new works of medieval art. That's like saying um, there's a, I don't know, a new dinosaur, you know, walking around. It's over. And yet, and yet. I maintain that when we look at works of art and then when we talk about them together, they are renewed. They do come into a different kind of light, the light of your interpretation, the light of your delight in them. Um, and I certainly hope that, that has happened today. So we'll end with these images and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. We're open for questions. Or comments for about three minutes. <laughs> Great. I was struck by the images that you showed of the traveling uh, mm. altars and stuff. Yep. And wondered if there was any direct connection between that and the uh, stories of the tabernacle in the Old Testament, uh, which was also traveling altar. And... I was waiting for there to be rings on the side of this so mm. that it wouldn't be touched by human hands. Oh, very wise. Very, very wise. Yes, and I do think that's why, I mean, especially this one, right, that really I picked up under the arm. Um, I'll go back to Countess Gertrude here. Um, the, you're so right. The location, where does the divine reside? Where does the divine reside? And all the writing around the tabernacle um, absolutely influences these portable altars. Part of that is one of the things that fascinates me so much about medieval history and is such a contrast to our understanding of history. Medieval history is, understands itself in layers, in layers. So the, what would be called in Western Europe the Old Testament, the New Testament, and us now in the Middle Ages. This is why they call themselves the New Age. We call them medieval because they're between ancient and modern in the middle. Um, but they definitely saw themselves as um, existing and more than that, affirming those layers. So I think you're absolutely right. I think there is something about the tabernacle here. The Christian translation of that, the lack of rings on the side is really interesting to me because again, these don't last. The church says, stop. <laughs> if you're going to be with the divine, it needs to be in church spaces. Um, and I think that that actually might be part of the dynamic, not just the power of 
being out and about with an altar, but also all that, all the, the, the human hands, which may not be consecrated. What if there's no priest and so forth? That's really, uh, thank you for that. Brilliant. And thank you so oh, much. This it was is wonderful. joy, absolute joy. Take care. Just a quick reminder that if you can help with the chairs, that's great. And also, this is our, the last bike course of this semester. But stay tuned. We'll be back sometime in January, early February, and you'll hear, hear from us. <laughs>